Um, yes, okay. Exactly. In the bottom. Oh. Can everyone see my screen? Not yet. Yep, I can see it. Okay. Um, shall I start then? Yep, please go. Okay, so um, my talk's based on joint work with uh, Shai Revzin, was my PhD advisor at the University of Michigan, um, Clay Scott, and Simon Wilson. And I should say at the outset that Simon uh, did a lot of heavy lifting writing code and generating figures, and he deserves a lot of credit for this. Um, so, some, okay. So, um, the motivation for uh, this work is, uh, <clears throat> in my academic lineage, there are a lot of people working with animals and robots, and they want to understand how they move. Um, so here's an example. Uh, on the left, there is a guinea fowl. And on the right, what you're seeing is just a bunch of kinematic data, foot positions of a guinea fowl running. And if you look at this cloud of bluish dots, you can see that it looks pretty complicated, but um, it's kind of clearly uh, demarcating an annular region. Uh, and if you were to plot these blue dots as functions of time, you see some kind of oscillatory behavior. And uh, what we, important for us, for our motivation, is that because uh, animals don't often want to cooperate with you, uh, it's not always very easy to get um, data comprising trajectory segments which last longer than the period of a cycle, let alone uh, many periods of a cycle. You might get trajectory segments that just look like this thick black line here uh, from an individual uh, trial. And um, so just to kind of set the stage and say what my theoretical framework is. Um, so what we want to do is we want to assume that um, uh, the systems, just like the one we saw, uh, evolve according, the underlying system evolves according to some ordinary differential equation. Um, we do, later on, I'll say something about um, the case of weak noise. Um, we do consider, say, Edo SDEs with, uh, with weak noise. Uh, but for now, let's just say the system evolves according to some deterministic ODE with um, flow phi of some CK vector field F, um, which has an asymptotically stable hyperbolic limit cycle gamma with some stability basin, which I'll denote throughout the talk as um, WS of gamma, WS for stable manifold. So um, what we assume is that we have X, X dot measurements, or really just X measurements, because we just take numerical differences to, to estimate velocity, or we at least assume that we have some observable from which through, say, a delay embedding, we can um, estimate X. But key for us is that we do not assume that we know F. Um, and now our goal is, and I'll say what, I, in a slide, I would explain what this is, but I think everyone knows. Um, so our goal is to compute the asymptotic phase of the limit cycle with data um, consisting, again, of a collection of arbitrarily short time series and without assuming that we know the equations of motion. Um, so I'll go quickly through most of this since we've all been talking about it, but perhaps it's worth pointing out um, something about asymptotic phase, which might be less commonly known. So, um, um, so because of the hyperbolicity of gamma, uh, there's an asymptotic phase map and um, it's often thought of as real valued or circle valued uh, but in the literature on normal hyperbolicity theory, um, which generalizes asymptotic phase to arbitrary invariant manifolds, um, often the way it's thought about there is it's a map which sends the stability basin to the invariant manifold itself, or in this case, gamma. Um, and the reason you can get away with circle valued phase or real valued phase in the limit cycle case is because the circle is diffeomorphic to uh, a circle. And um, in fact, it's true that the um, basin of attraction, uh, that on the basin of attraction, there's a global change of coordinates valid everywhere, um, which straightens out the isochrones into an object which, after a change of coordinates, is just the normal bundle of gamma, or 
if the state space is orientable, it's not too twisted, it's not like a Mobius band, then um, the entire basin of attraction is diffeomorphic to the product of gamma with the Euclidean space in such a way that isochrones just get sent to um, copies of Rn minus one. Um, so that, that's the only bit that I think everyone might not already know, but um, you can, from this formulation, you can kind of uh, churn out all the other definitions of phase. So for example, if you want real value phase, you just pick a solution, uh, parameterization of the limit cycle, restrict to um, the interval zero T where T is the period and post compose the inverse of that with P and that gives you the standard real valued phase. And um, the, I'll say more about this representation later on. It ends up being important for our algorithm, uh, the fact that this representation is discontinuous. So, um, but you know, every, like everyone's been saying already, um, phase gives you a simple reduced ordered model for the system, which just evolves at rate one on here, this interval zero to T. Um, and I won't say why we should care because everyone else has already said this. So um, now our goal in a picture is to take data like the data set I showed you before um, without knowing uh, this limit cycle and um, compute an, esti an estimate of the limit cycle, but also compute an estimate of the asymptotic phase and thereby also all of these isochrones, um, something like what's shown on the right here. Um, now, a caveat is that although um, the uh, although the isochrones have this very globally intricate structure, as you can see when you zoom in around the singular point here, you get this kind of fractal-like behavior. Um, because we're just working with data, it will never get data arbitrarily close to the boundary of the stability basin. Um, we're not going to even hope to, to compute the isochrones out here. Um, this, this figure was produced from this paper where they're using uh, relatively sophisticated continuation methods to get this picture, but we'll be content with just getting isochrones in kind of this, uh, a compact annular sort of region around the limit cycle here. Um, so what are the existing methods to compute asymptotic phase? Well, I doubt that this is an exhaustive list, but these are the ones that I know about. Um, I don't want to talk too much in detail about all of them, but um, there's a bunch of numerical methods. Some of them um, require knowledge of equations of motion, some don't, but to my knowledge, um, at least one is true of all of the above methods. So either equations of motion are required to be known or trajectory segments longer than multiple oscillation periods are required or the method only produces something which is valid basically just on the limit cycle, either the phase response curve or an infinitesimal version of it. And what our goal for our algorithm is to produce, uh, is to require none of these things. Um, okay, so again, what we want, we want to compute an R-valued phase, but we have a problem here. Um, so recall that the sort of geometrically defined asymptotic phase map, or, or even the circle valued asymptotic phase map, is um, as smooth as the vector field, but the real valued phase has this annoying discontinuity um, at the place where it's zero. And I, this is often glossed over, but um, it really matters for us and it really um, causes problems early on because standard regression tools or machine learning tools, they assume smoothness or at least continuity. Um, we could instead try to compute a circle valued phase, which is again, as smooth as the vector field, but I, this also seems to lead to unnecessarily complicated regression problems where you have a complex valued re regression and you want to impose a unit norm constraint. And um, we didn't want to deal with that. So what we ended up doing in a nutshell, at, at least morally speaking, is we, um, in air quotes, easily compute a relatively simple um, multi-valued function 
uh, a multi-valued real valued function with, with a property that if we just subtract that away from the true real valued asymptotic phase, what you get is a function which is nice and smooth and as a single valued function. And after we do this easy part, this residual can just be fit with standard regression techniques because the residual is nice and smooth. Um, there's no problem. Um, now I'll say what, what I mean by multi-valued and there's a few ways to define that. And the way that um, we think about it and how I'll talk about it here is a multi-valued function um, I think about it as you fix, you fix a base point, say in the limit cycle or anywhere in the stability basin. And uh, you have this thing called a closed one form, which um, if you're not familiar with one forms, if we're in RN, I would say, just think about that as a vector field whose Jacobian is everywhere symmetric. So this is a vector field, which is locally the gradient of some function, but not globally. And, um, so you fix some base point, and, and so you can, you can do line integrals of one forms, just like you do line integrals of vector fields. So you fix some base point, and you wanna know the value of your multi-valued functional at, or function at some other point, and you just pick up, you pick, you consider all paths joining the base point to this other point, and you integrate the closed one form along the path. And now the line integrals of closed one forms, they, depend only on the path homotopy class of the path joining the two points. That is, if you fix the endpoints and you deform some path, the line integral doesn't change. Um, but if you take paths which wrap differently around different holes in your space, or in this case, they wrap around the limit cycle different numbers of times, then you can get different numbers. Um, now this, if you do some topology, this is actually, a, kind of an equivalent way of, or I would even drop kind of, equivalent way of uh, kind of automatically encoding uh, the so-called unwrapped jump periodic boundary conditions like that in K.O. Lindner Thomas. And I'd be happy to talk about this with anyone interested. Um, uh, so again, if, if you're not comfortable with one forms, just think vector field. The reason we are using one forms and not vector fields is for a couple of reasons. Um, one, in, in, to a, at least from a differential geometric perspective, uh, it ends up being much more natural for uh, a natural way to describe the gradient of phase. Um, and there are also a bunch of operations which you can do naturally on differential forms which um, can't be done naturally on vector fields. And what I mean by natural is that you can only do them if you arbitrarily select a Riemannian metric for your space. And, and selecting a Riemannian metric allows you to identify forms and vector fields. But if we're in RN, kind of the standard metric is just the Euclidean metric. And so um, it's really easy to just conflate forms and vector fields. Um, so, okay, like I said, although, uh, our real valued asymptotic phase is not continuous everywhere. Um, it's gradient, amazingly enough, does have a um, smooth global extension. So I claim that this is one way to define this global extension and I'll, I'll back up my claim in a moment. So the, first I, so the first step is just on the limit cycle itself, which is one dimensional, define a one form. One way to think about one forms is they're dual to vector field. So they're, they're gadgets which take in a vector field, eat it, and spit out a number. So um, on the limit cycle itself, to find a one form uh, phi tilde via phi tilde, when it eats the vector field, it just gives you one everywhere. And because the limit cycle is one dimensional, this uniquely defines phi tilde. And then what you can do, there's a standard operation called pullback on differential forms, which just looks like this. Um, and we'll say phi is the pullback. And what that means is you just, how does phi, um, what does phi do when phi wants to eat a vector? Well, you map the vector via DP down to the limit cycle, and then you feed the result to phi tilde. Now, um, I claim that this actually gives you um, a global extension of the um, 
gradient. I'm doing a uh, gradient in air quotes because gradient is an operation on vector fields. The corresponding operation on differential forms is called the exterior derivative, but we're in Rn. They're basically the same thing. Um, so here's the computation. You just do D of alpha and use the chain rule. And this term here, um, if you think about it, ends up just being the exact same thing as phi tilde. And so what we get is that D alpha, when we look at the definition, is just equal to phi, at least where D alpha is defined. And D alpha is only defined away from the places where alpha is zero, because that's the discontinuity set of alpha. Um, and um, just to hammer home this point a bit more, although phi coincides with D alpha away from the places where alpha is zero, phi is not globally equal to D of anything on the entire basin of attraction, because if you take the, uh, if you, um, take the line integral of D of anything along a closed loop, you have to get zero. This is the same as saying if you integrate a gradient vector field along a closed loop, you get zero. But when you integrate phi over the limit cycle, because of this property that um, phi tilde and hence phi of f is identically equal to one, you just get the period of the limit cycle, which is not zero. So phi cannot be the gradient of anything. Um, now we call phi the temporal one form of the oscillator. And the reason for that is if you take any solution curve, any solution curve segment and integrate phi along it, do the line integral, what you get is just the time difference along the trajectory modulo the period of the oscillator. And in general, if you just have any smooth path and you integrate phi along the smooth path, then you just get um, the difference of the real valued phase at the endpoints of the two, uh, at the two endpoints of the path, but modulo the period of the oscillator. Um, James, can I ask, how am I doing on time? I forgot to make a uh, note. Uh, well, um, seven minutes until Max starts speaking. So okay. We'd, we'd like to ask a few questions too, probably, if you can. Okay, so I should go much faster. Sorry, yeah, thanks. Okay, so. no, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, the temporal one form satisfies like two properties. One is that D of phi is zero. Um, and there are a bunch of ways to state this in terms of vector fields. The simplest way, I'll just say, if we're in three-dimensional space and we identify phi with a vector field, this condition just means that phi has no curl. And then the second condition is that phi of f is identically equal to one. And then um, uh, in my thesis, I proved that there's actually a unique one form defined on any positively invariant tubular neighborhood containing a limit cycle, which satisfies the above two properties. And so it's got this, this one form has got to be the temporal one form, but the important point is that these are um, local, one's an infinite, one is in, one is a pointwise property and one is an infinitesimal property. And so they're, um, these two properties kind of help our algorithm. Okay, so because of the preceding theorem, we can write the temporal one form as the unique solution to this um, optimization problem here um, because the integrand is just identically equal to zero for the temporal one form. And, um, we can discretize the integral by writing it as a sum. Um, okay, and now if you do some, a little bit of algebraic topology, what's called the de Rom cohomology, the first de Rom cohomology of the basin of attraction or of any tubular neighborhood is one dimensional. And what that means is that if you take an arbitrary closed one form beta having integral equal to T around the limit cycle, then the temporal one form is just equal to beta plus some exact form, which just means D of some function, basically the gradient of some function. So the idea for our algorithm is just pick any very simple, the simplest possible closed beta, which satisfies this property. And then, um, and so what we do in particular is we numerically construct kind of phase amplitude coordinates um, and uh, what we do is for beta, we just take beta to be the angle uh, one form in these coordinates. And then we seek a, just a Taylor Fourier series for the remainder H. And we solve for, um, we, and you can compute DH symbolically and plug it in and all the AJKs still kind of stay in there in a clean form. And now you just solve for the AJKs via now an unconstrained least squares problem. So by doing this topology, we could, um, we could turn our constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained problem and solve it with least squares. This picture kind of shows the algorithm steps. 
um, we change coordinates, then we um, rescale we rescale space, and in this rescaled space, we we take beta to be the angle um, the angle one form, and then here we're we're just fitting uh, the residual term. Here's um, some order terms like up to order two, up to order six, and then we push everything back into the original coordinates at the end. Um, this is just illustrating um, what all of the basis function terms for, for fitting the residual look like. Um, and now for SDE data, um, or for data with noise, um, I proved this theorem in my thesis, which says roughly that um, you pick any epsilon, and if the noise variance and, um, and mean um, are small enough, and you have enough data, then with uh, arbitrarily high probability, the isochrones you get will be with an epsilon of the true isochrones and the C1 topology. Um, okay, so I'll just finish with some eye candy of results. Um, uh, so here's our algorithm run on this Selkov uh, glycolysis um, oscillator and um, I'll have to just uh, blow through these, but we're com we, we compare our algorithm to a few other ones here. Um, ours is shown on the right, and it's um, the fact that uh, you're seeing ice crows on the right, but clouds of points on the left is showing that our algorithm is kind of really outperforming uh, the other ones. Um, the last one I'll mention is um, you could ask how well do does our algorithm do against other state-of-the-art algorithms um, if we assume that we do know the equations of motion. And so here we compare our algorithm to a state-of-the-art one by these guys on the Fitzhugh-Nagumo system. And um, we assume that we just have data within uh, this little annular region around the limit cycle. And um, so what we plot here in pastel are their isochrones. And then what we plot in black near the limit cycle are our isochrones. And you can see that the black ones are kind of almost perfectly overlapping the isochrones computed in their paper, like you can't really even see them here, but here's one where we don't do as well. Um, and on the right here, we plot the phase response curves. Um, the red is uh, the phase response curve for one of the variables from there, or uh, obtained by forward integration. Blue is obtained from our algorithm. Um, the top is a, a different variable. Um, same thing for the colors, and we, we kind of uh, match pretty closely the forward integration phase response curve. Uh, so I'll skip through future work and uh, that's it. Um, sorry if I went a bit over. That's okay, thanks Matt. Um, any questions quickly? Yeah, I've got a question, um, uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, do you need to be able to observe all the components or what happens if you only observe you know, a, a, a projection of the trajectory? Um, that's a good question. Um, in principle, we need all the components as input to our algorithm, but what we, do, what we have done um, and we have one example in our paper, which is under review, that I haven't shown here. Um, we, for systems where we only observe, say, one um, variable, we'd, we've just been doing a, a delay embedding. So we, like, you know, lag that variable several times, and that acts, um, you know, via Tawkins' theorem, uh, that should act as a surrogate for the full state. And um, when we run our algorithm, on that surrogate, we seem to get reasonable results. Okay. I'd love to see the paper. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's been under review for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that was really interesting, Matt. Thanks again for that. Oh, thanks, James. Uh, cheers. Okay, There's a question well, in the Q&A uh, from oh. Ian. How long does the algorithm take for a given set of data? That's a great, great question. And you know what, honestly, I don't know because um, Simon has kind of been the code guy for this paper and I have been the theory guy. And so I'd have to ask Simon, honestly. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so we might move on to Maximilian. If you can make Maximilian the host, Matt. Um, let's if you see can if I can figure that out. Okay, great. 
second. 